Well, welcome back to the Azure podcast. This is episode number 377 being recorded on the 12th of May, 2021. I'm Sajid and on Teams with me, we have Cynthia, Kale, Evan and Kendall. And we're here to have a kind of a roundtable discussion today on a very special topic that's pretty hot these days, the topic of NFTs or non-fungible tokens, as our resident uh, blockchain expert, Kale, will explain to us in just a minute. But before that, uh, Evan, I believe you put something uh, in yeah, terms of news uh, from this last week. Yeah, th this was just kind of, so some of this that, you know, I'd heard internally, but I, I hadn't heard us disclose it externally. So I thought it was some interesting numbers to go through. Um, the, the first is that, you know, we're predicting we're going to be building 50 to 100 new DC data centers every year. Uh, which is crazy numbers, um, right? We've already got, two, you know, 200-ish or so. Um, we have 165,000 miles of subsea cable. Um, and then we um, also are, and this one's more of a feature thing, um, but we are on target to have availability zones in every country in which we operate by the end of calendar year 2021. Um, right, and all new regions that we launch will have availability. And this is one of the things we get knocked on periodically, right? Hey, this this data center that was one of the early data centers, right? It doesn't have zones, or or it's missing this, um, you know. But I just I just thought seeing some of those numbers on paper was just amazing, right? I mean, you think about the amount of compute pro compute power that spins up when we're adding fifty to hundred data centers every year. How many like how many servers go into a data center approximately? Oh, I I mean I don't even know. Um, it's got to be uh, what ten thousand at least. Uh, probably something like that. Oh, all I'm thinking about is when I'm provisioning resources in Azure, that list for location is going to keep getting so <laughs> Just keeps long. Just getting longer and longer. <laughs> the, that reminds me, we used to have this. So we had a bug many 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 years ago where and i can't remember which region it was that was in the top of the list at the time but we kept having capacity issues in that region because everybody that would just go oh i just want to create a resource to test something would pick that region and so we ended up having to do some stuff just you know sort of change it and change it globally and you show local and you know you you know you're enabled for different ones i like we did a whole bunch of things of that but like it's just that yeah it's amazing how impactful that drop down is. Awesome. And I believe uh, Kendall to, has something as well. Yeah, so just wanted to call out really quickly that the uh, Azure Static Web Apps is now GA. And so if you're interested in building those kind of full stack uh, web apps with the pre-built kind of pre-rendered static uh, front ends, you can now do that uh, in a GA fashion. So if you've been using that in preview or anything like that, um, just wanted to to call that out there. And a lot of the times, like with this, you can take advantage of a lot of other features. So a lot of customers will use like um, Azure Functions and some of those like service serverless API models to back in this. So I uh, just wanted to call that out, and we'll make sure to drop the the notes in the uh, the chat about how you can leverage this if you're interested. So how does a static website work with uh, something functions like you know functions whatever behind it, which is not static? How, like it does it change the content of the static files? So I think you can just integrate it from your front end and call out to an Azure serverless, you know, function. So like maybe not the the content being generated on the the front end is static, right? But you can integrate it with APIs, you gotcha. know, clicking in or going okay. to another that call out too. Gotcha. Um, that, okay. Yeah, they're typically like Angular JS uh, front end or something or some JavaScript front end, and it's uh, I believe this one's uh, it's served out of GitHub, right? I think this is the one where yeah, it's integrated yeah. with GitHub. Yeah, I don't. Oh, think gotcha. You can, okay. You can host them in Azure Storage, but I don't think that static like the static hosting right. in Azure Storage is GA. That's different. It's... That's different. Yeah, that's yeah. the one in storage. Are you talking about the one in App Services? Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of push your code to GitHub, and you tell App Service, "Mike, that's where my code is." <clears throat> it pulls it in and just runs it at runtime. You know and that's it, you get Interesting. a okay. cool website. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I want to make one comment back to the uh, to the data center discussion earlier. So just because data uh, data center does not the same as adding regions, right? I mean, we, we, we're adding right. a lot of data centers to existing regions because they're running out of capacity, as you say, in regions. And so they have to keep adding more and more data centers, uh, you know, just to keep up with the capacity. So a lot of those those data centers that just go to ex, uh, to existing regions, but yeah, I do agree. The number of regions is going to increase as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and and to be clear, before I get yelled at later, 
doesn't mean we're running out of capacity. We are just trying to stay ahead of capacity demand. Thank you, you Mr. Heard, CXP. You heard yes. it here first. Evan Baslick was the one who said that. <laughs> Who's that Evan? Yeah, well, he used to work here. He's not here anymore. <laughs> And uh, hey, Russell, good to see you. Um, so let's uh, jump on to our uh, special topic today, which is NFTs. So we'll ask uh, Kale to first ex expand on that acronym for us, as we like to do to get things started. Yeah, sure. So uh, happy to talk here today about this. So NFTs, and we always get uh, dinged for using abbreviation. So it's that represents what's called a non-fungible token, as uh, Sajit mentioned in the title. And what that means is um, there's been a lot of hype around this in the uh, you know, media space and internet space and whatnot around these things. But um, just to kind of set a base level here about what these things are, they're basically a, a token, uh, a digital token. So it's a piece of code that, or that basically will guarantee a uniqueness uh, to something. Uh, so a really abstract definition is it's kind of like a license or like uh, something like that that goes along with something. So uh, to put that in more concrete terms, if you think about something that's the canonical use case, like a baseball card, right, that we used to collect as kids, uh, some of us who are older. Uh, but basically, we had this physical asset, right? And, and there were so only so many of those. And it turns out that 30 or 40 years later, if you have certain ones, they're actually worth a lot of money uh, because they were scarce or because there was only so many of those created or whatnot. Same concept, uh, except for it's digital, right? So one of the big ones that came out here uh, is NBA Top Shots. Um, so what that is, is LeBron James, you know, dunks a basketball and there's a 10 second clip of that, a GIF. Um, that thing can be turned into an NFT, which basically means we signed 100 copies of this GIF. And now we've minted those as this person uh, and, and handed those out to people. Now people have those. It doesn't mean that they actually own that, that GIF or that image or any of the likeness or any of that thing to it. It just means they're one of 100 who has this thing that was created on this date. And maybe in the future that becomes worth more money or something. Who knows? Um, so they're paying fees for these. This sort of feels like, you know, you, you go out and you can buy the artwork um, and when you look, it says one of whatever. And you don't, you know, you don't really know for sure that it's actually one of, you know, 10,000, right? They could have printed, you know, 50 runs of one of 10,000, right? You don't know. In this case, you're, we're, there's basically a way to go back to it and say, yes, this is one of the first hundred guaranteed. Here's the here's the proof in the in the chain of, of ownership, right? That's right. And it also allows you to like resell it, right? So you as the owner are the only one who can now resell that, right? So if you said, hey, I, I now own this thing and now there's only 50 of these and it turns out the price goes up. So now I want to sell it to Sajid and I can charge a higher price and say, hey, if you want this, there's only 50 of them. And so now you'll pay me more money for it or whatnot. The interesting thing is like uh, at what Evan mentions, though, like the permeance of this. Um, so this gets into some of the like looking through some of the FUD that's going on, FUD being fear, uncertainty and doubt. Uh, but basically, if you said, uh, I, I guarantee I'm using this, let's say NBA Top Shots, for instance, that there's a blockchain behind that, right, called Flow uh, that's using it. But if uh, that thing ceases to exist or something in the future, so does that thing that you have attached to it, right? And this is where people need to like kind of look at the fine print and understand what they're getting into of like, what is the back end of this thing? Where does it reside? Is it guaranteed it's going to be there for the rest of my life? Uh, which is the promise that oh. most put on these, you know? Yeah. If it, yeah. So if that goes out of business, you have no thing. Right. So a lot of the ones that are a lot more like what I would say reputable or people should be looking at are ones that use public blockchains. Uh, because those ones, you know, have a less chance of going down, right? There's not a single company behind it that can say, hey, we're done with this because it's not making yeah. money or whatnot. Um, those are going to be there because they're supported by a much larger global community. Um, so those are good, right? Um, and if you have stuff up there, you can pretty much bank that they're going to be there. And I'm, again, I'm not dumping on these other ones. Uh, there's a bunch of these platforms spinning up. I think they're trying to solve specific problems and this is a very like emerging space. So they're trying to make them go cheaper and faster and do all kinds of different things. And I think that's fine. I just think people need to be aware of like what they're, what they're buying. Don't spend a million dollars on something if you don't know where it actually resides, you know, like. Can I ask a question? I know Cynthia put her hand up first, but I really did have a question. If you could see my face. 
I just haven't raised my hand yet in teams. Okay, so I have two questions that I think are both relevant. So one is this can only be things that are digitally stored assets. Like it's not going to be a non-digital asset because if I buy a baseball, I don't know how it could have like the baseball is not going to cease to exist when the digital identity. So like, I would assume it has to be something that you can buy or sell online. That's not a hundred percent true. Uh, in a majority of cases, it is something digital, like you said, but for instance, take your case, like a baseball, right? That baseball right today, if you get a baseball signed by some famous baseball player, right? Usually to, ha to have that be worth money, you have a certificate or something that goes along with it, certifies this guy signed it, we saw it, all that stuff. Right. Uh, this could be that. Right. So you can tie those things together. And the way those get bound is probably your next question is uh, usually we have some sort of unique fingerprint from that thing uh, that we use as the hash that goes along with the certificate. So they're inextricably linked. But when OK, so I guess so let me let me understand. So like I thought what you were saying is when the identity doesn't exist, the actual asset dissolves along with it. But what you're saying is the uh, the guarantee or guarantor that comes along with that. Uh, with that asset would cease to exist. Therefore, you couldn't necessarily validate the baseball in the future if that you know blockchain provider was to no longer exist. That's right. The entity would lose its value. So it wouldn't That's necessarily right. be like the baseball is no longer signed by that person or the baseball doesn't exist. It would just be you can no longer use that identity as a way to validate that that ball is worth X Y Z or that it's one of you know a thousand. Hundred um, percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And is okay. It makes sense. I get it. What can it, yeah okay. So does it? <laughs> I'm trying to like who, who's maintaining like is it uh, the, an, a specific organization that wants to use this as an identity mechanism would you know go out and be a customer of like Ethereum or implement Ethereum or one of these other blockchain providers within a custom application or is there like a single source that is you know maintaining all of this? I, I guess I'm trying to figure out who from that perspective you know is somebody at this a specific company implementing this system um or is it like there's a a single provider of this to all external organizations does that make sense so there's some i'll take a crack at it there's some standards around this technology like what is an nft uh, obviously it must possess certain attributes like be guaranteed unique uh be immutable have one owner you know all these kind of attributes about it so those get implemented typically in smart contracts or something like smart contracts, depending on the, the technology being used. Uh, Ethereum obviously uses smart contracts, but others use different technology that's similar to smart contract technology for that. So there's a standard around it. Now, one beef I have with it right now, or one thing I worry about is like interop, right? So like you pick a provider, well, tomorrow I want to move it to a different one. Can I do that, right? And there's there's work going on in this space as well to make that something, these bridges, we'll call them, between these blockchains because they're all using different technology to define what's an NFT. But you could foreseeably, like technically, build a bridge between them to say, hey, I'm going to push this thing over here and it's going to go onto this other chain and then it disappears on this one. Um, so that's, I worry about that and I hope we get there. Wait, sorry, one follow-up question just to make sure I get it. I guess my question is if I go buy the baseball, do I Kindle as a as a consumer say I want some kind of NFT, I'm going to go to a third party and have them generate one for me or would it be the seller how, generates it for all of them and then it's tied like who's responsible for the initial creation of the identity for the purchaser? Yeah, it's usually the creator. So if the person's okay. signing something or if they created something, it's the creators who's responsible to create okay. it. Yeah. And they're going to use probably third-party technology to generate that, right? They don't have to necessarily implement their own NFT provider, I guess. That's that's right. Uh, okay. I call them like NFT platforms, but yeah, that's what's emerging, these platforms that okay. enable okay. this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, that makes sense. Lots of hands up. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, <laughs> going back to like the previous point where you say for that you can purchase an NFT for that 10-second gift but that does not translate to ownership of the gift. Then what is, is the appeal purely for like social status and being able to say that I own this NFT that's associated with that gift? Because I'm also curious, like, can it become part of ownership as well using NFT? That's that's true, right? So the licensing that you're talking about or the copyright uh, essentially to this thing, this asset, right? In this case, a GIF, uh, it can be defined by the creator, right? I could say, hey, I created this GIF of me dancing 
and I only created one of them and I created an NFT for it and I sold it out here, right? And whoever gets it can have the actual source for that. And they they own the whole thing, the whole asset. They can do whatever they want with it. I could also say, no, you're not allowed to do anything with it. You're allowed to display it. And here's how you here's the license for what you can do with that thing. Uh, but you are one of a hundred who own one of these things, right? Which makes them semi-scarce uh, in in some people's minds, I guess. You know. So, so what you're saying is that like NFT can define to the level of granularity of what each type of ownership can do. That you can essentially have like tiered members of if you're like a gold member, you can do all these things, and if you're a silver member, you can only like display. Mm-hmm. That's right. Got it. So it's not as, uh, you know, clear, I think, uh, up front as like what people are buying. And that's why I say you got to kind of uh, look what you're getting into. Right. Um, I'm not saying these are bad or anything. I think it's kind of cool technology. It's just understanding what are my rights when I when I purchase this thing? What does this entail me to do? What am I allowed to do with this? You know. So uh, am I right in thinking there's nothing in the technology to prevent somebody duplicating the thing itself? It's just all about the NFT that's linked with it that you can't copy and you can't compromise. And, it, and it's that that's the, the, the valuable thing really is the, is the token that says what the provenance is. That's right. Right. So, for instance, if I hand some superstar a baseball back to the earlier example and have him sign it, uh, that signature is important, right? You could take one and duplicate the signature and say, hey, I got the same thing. But this one actually has proof of whoever digitally signed that, uh, that this this thing actually happened, right? Like this is the person who signed it. So in this case, maybe the NBA, you know, for, for something like that. You can't duplicate the NBA's keys, right? So you could never impersonate yourself as the NBA. You could take that GIF and say, oh, I'm going to do the same thing, but it won't be signed by the NBA. So it's less useful. So it is an exact parallel to masterpieces that have been drawn at some point and then the prints that are made and forgeries that can be copied and displayed and what have you. It's, it's exactly the same kind of thing. And, and I guess I don't understand what is some, you know, some of the reasons as to why people pay so much money for something that looks identical, but actually it's provenance is there and that, that's what you're paying for. It's, um, yeah, it's that value. It's, it's a strange concept, isn't it? Well, the, well, the interesting thing with like the NBA and if you look at how the cards, we'll call them cards, like digital cards have happened, Think about like when you were a kid, if you bought like baseball cards, we we didn't know what was in there, right? You buy a pack and then you had to buy a bunch of packs so that you could get this whole series, right? Same thing happens here, right? So they're doing that same concept with these. So you'll buy a pack of these things, maybe it's gifts, but there's like only one that does this one certain thing. And so you have to keep buying those packs or trading them with your friends to get the whole series. So there's that gaming spin on it as well, you know? And for our UK listeners, so he's talking about baseball, which is a game we don't have over here. So the equivalent is football cards, right? Or soccer, as they know it. In this, in this. For our international crowd, yes. Yeah, it was Russ, when you said the thing about the, the art, that is funny, though, because I did watch a documentary on Netflix about, like, a huge forgery scheme and, like, the provenance and that concept. And that's exactly what I was thinking of. It's like, oh, I bet you could use this in that scenario to prove out, you know, the provenance of something. So that's really interesting. So this sort of, as I as I as I listen to this, what and I tie it back to um, when we had somebody on to talk about um, using blockchain for um, identity stuff. Does that say that at the end of the day, that that identity work is in essence an 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 NFT on on me, right? Like. Like that's my proof, that's my providence that I'm who I say I am. Like, is is that sort of? I mean, it's the same concept, or is there some fundamental piece that's that I'm missing here? No, I, I think from a high level, it's probably right. But the the clear definition of what an NFT, a non fungible token, is is something that could be traded uh, or or moved around. Like the ownership of that thing could move. I I don't know that we want to get into you know. <laughs> <laughs> that concept okay. here, but but, but, uh, but, as, but as far as the Evan's wife is, is like, okay, sounds good. Yeah, Who wants swap. to drink? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's been eighteen months in the same house. She's ready to swap me. Um, the but but I mean it, the the fundamental technology and the and sort of the interaction back with the blockchain, right? That is the same there, right? And and so obviously they diverge at some point, right? But but the the way that you validate identity, the way that you validate you know provenance, all that stuff, that's 
the same functionally, if I'm understanding yeah. you right. Yeah, the digital signatures that go along with this stuff, yeah. same technology, right? That's used in core blockchain, cryptocurrency, everything else, same thing. So it's just that it's you're 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 creating a unique identity for these gifts, right? Yep. Same way as you're yeah. creating. Yeah. Okay, that makes the okay. Answer. That ties together nicely in my head. Thank you. We're saying like gifts, like the little images from the from the computer, right? That's yeah. what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was, it's it's a, such an interesting example. Yeah. Yes. I was just making sure. I was like, is that what we're saying? Are we talking about gifts? But I guess we're going back to the the basketball example when we say that, right? The basketball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, before we get not into me. the Azure, I'm not a gift. I'm a real person. I, okay. I promise. <laughs> before we get into the Azure spit on this, one other thing I wanted to mention that'll really blow your mind is um, so we talk about non fungible tokens. There's also a thing called fungible tokens, right? And a fungible token, you can think about a fungible token as uh, cash, right? Is it is a really clear concept of that? If I have a dollar bill and Sajid has a dollar bill, uh, mm-hmm. they're essentially the same thing. They're not pets, they're cattle essentially like yeah. we, we can just interchange them and they're still worth a dollar right everything's the same where a non-fungible is totally unique in the world right this one thing there's only one of it or a hundred of it or whatever so the interesting thing is some of the token technology and standards are now allowing we're building uh, technology to nest these things so for instance i could have a let's talk about cats here I could have a uh, a non fungible cat like a, a crypto kitty, and for those who don't know what that is, I'll drop it in the uh, notes. But crypto kitties are NFTs. They're basically like a little Tamagotchi uh, that runs on blockchain. So basically, these these NFTs could now hold fungible tokens. So food, uh, the cat could have food that actually is fungible. Um, so you could build these nested hierarchies, and whenever I sell that cat, his food goes along with him. Right. So there's some crazy uh, ideas coming around here to mix these uh, different types of token technologies. Now my head hurts. Thanks, Kale. <laughs> <laughs> Azure spin. All right. So the Azure spin on this, people always say, well, why is Azure? Why is Microsoft uh, even interested in this stuff? Well, one is for the blockchain angle, obviously, the blockchain networks that power these kind of things. It happens that most of these are public, and most of the work we do in blockchain is private blockchains or consortiums. But we do um, have stuff built into our tooling to work with public blockchains. So the same technology, building smart contracts, all the stuff we've done over the years can be used here as well. So uh, all the existing tooling and things that we built for specific blockchains still work here. Everything's great. Uh, the same technology for like key management and things like that. So with the people who are building these NFT platforms, they need ways to handle wallets and keys and all these digital signatures. Technology we've been working on for blockchain as well. So there's definitely work going on there with our partners uh, to help power those and use Azure. So that's kind of like the Azure spin of why we would be involved here. We have a lot of cool tech uh, to do things all the way from confidential compute to our Azure Key Vault with our key management, uh, to just general compute to run nodes uh, to do this stuff. And then our dev tooling um, is kind of our, our our thing in the game there. Kale, I know there has been a lot of conversation around just the environmental impact with blockchain in general. And I know like Microsoft has been a forerunner in like making sure we have our environmental and just climate change policies in place to go carbon negative so how how do these play together or are there some misconceptions of like mining requires a lot of energy yeah so this is a good question right because uh, again a lot of these run on public networks public blockchains where there's thousands or tens of thousands of computers and in current form today running this thing called proof of work which basically is a lot of compute power right so these machines are being hammered so that's a lot of carbon footprint, right? And um, even though we do small transactions for NFTs, it's still using that global network, right? So the, the meter's still running over there. So a couple things around this, um, and NFTs have gotten a lot of heat for this, right? Because if people start using these a lot, it's like, well, you're not really helping the environment here because you're you're contributing to some bad stuff here. So a couple things. One is the blockchain technology is evolving into things called proof of stake and other different consensus algorithms, which are much more lightweight. Uh, we can run them on Raspberry Pis, for instance. We don't need like superpower computers and all that kind of stuff to do it. So that's one angle that's continuing to evolve. There's already people running some of this stuff out there for even some of these NFT platforms. 
Uh, but there's also this thing called side chains, uh, which have developed. And a side chain is basically something that could hang off of one of these main chains, but don't have to interact with it so much, right? So the side chain uh, is there to provide validity to what's happening over on this chain over here, but it doesn't need to do transactions constantly back into there. So you could still argue that, hey, you still have a dependency on it, so it still needs to run. But I would say that as that one changes to proof of stake or other technologies that makes it lighter carbon footprint, the side chain gets more benefit from that. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, the other thing is these private networks, right? So I mentioned some of these platforms, you have to know what you're getting into. Some of them are just running their own custom blockchain, which is very lightweight. So those guys will uh, also play that angle and say, hey, well, ours isn't as carbon you know, footprint because we have a much smaller network. Uh, you could play devil's advocate both ways there and say, well, yeah, but if it's smaller, then I have more risk because I'm more dependent on you as opposed to some global supercomputer type thing. So there, there's a bunch of different ways to look at it. The other thing that's kind of coming forward is a carbon tax, which doesn't really help the carbon footprint, but it's actually helping, you know, replant trees and, and pay for this upfront. So for instance, if every time I want to transfer an NFT, I have to pay a carbon tax because I'm using this big network and that's enforced by the protocol. So there's no way to get out of it. You have to pay for that uh, to help the network and, and help the environment. That's another angle uh, that's helping. Again, I feel like that's more of a short to medium term thing. The longer term is change the backbone of some of these public networks so that we're less carbon footprint heavy and, and solve the problem. Can I just ask a quick one on that, on the environmental thing? With I know with, with Ethereum too, they're moving to proof of stake, right? Is that is that right? I just wanted to know what the difference between proof of work, proof of stake is. I know I know there's a big environmental shift, but what, what what's you know, in a very layman's terms, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, so real quick, in a, in a proof of work system, which exists today for the big like Bitcoin and public Ethereum and, and others, they basically compete to be the one to write the next block. So you send a transaction to say, hey, I want to move an NFT from Evan to Cynthia, right? And they pay a little fee to use the transaction to put that on a network. That transaction gets packaged into a block, but who gets to write that block is a miner. And that's when you hear about mining. So they compete yeah. to be the miner, and that requires a lot of compute. So I have to do a really hard math problem. In proof of stake, it's more like this. Um, people essentially have currency in this network, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or something, and they stake it, which basically means they escrow it. So they would say, hey, I want to be a participant in this network, and here's my to Bitcoin or to Ethereum or whatever. And that thing gets locked up so they can't touch it. Now, every time a block gets produced, a new block needs to get produced, everybody benefits, right? So instead of me making a million, I think it's like maybe $50,000 or something on Ethereum to mine the next block. Instead of me making that, I just make a microtransaction, but everybody gets a part of that transaction. And if I don't keep my machine up that, that basically validates that transaction, then I get penalized. So it starts to take some of my stake hence the proof of stake thing, right? So if I misbehave, some of my stake is taken away from me and, and given back to other people as a reward. Um, so again, and you don't need a lot of, um, there's no competition going on there, right? Because everybody's just validating a transaction. So it's a very small amount of compute work that needs to happen. Great, thank you. I think that makes it a little bit clearer. I think I've got some more readings to do afterwards. <laughs> Sorry if that's not 100% clear, but I'll send some links uh, in the show notes. Oh, that'd be great, thanks. I've been trying to get my head around this uh, in the last few weeks. Actually, it's been interesting. I knew yes, you'd know so. as well. Cool. Uh, this is this is great, Kale. It's it's always neat to sort of loop back around and and see the interactions, both you know some some of the stuff going on in I mean, not not that it's unreal, but the real world, right? You know, and then how that sort of ties back to the technologies and what cloud computing and Azure are enabling and stuff. It, it's neat to me to see those connections because you don't always, until you really drill into them, I don't always see them personally, right? I hadn't ever made that NFT to identity, you know, connection until we talked about it today. And that's like, oh, wow. Like, I, you know, so it's, so no, definitely appreciate you coming in and, and we're not coming in. Let's leading the conversation today on this. You're always here, um, you know, and, and explain this. I, I, again, my head hurts a little bit, but I think I feel a little bit better this time than I did last time. And I felt better last time than this time. Yeah. Any, any uh, last comments? 
I'll definitely send some links through. And there's also a really funny video. So for people who want to see something really funny, uh, there was um, at SNL, Saturday Night Live, did a uh, skit that's like a parody of an Eminem song uh, to, to what's an NFT. It's very funny. I'll, I'll send it along as oh, well. I missed that. I saw where Elon Musk was on and, and he played some financial advisor. Um, <laughs> On weekend update, but I did not see the song. Yes, well, yeah, the Doji sure Father, I think it was, wasn't it? What's that? I think he called himself the Doji Father. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Any last questions for yeah. KOL before yeah. we call it a day? Cynthia's just cracking up. She is just she's been laughing the whole time today. <laughs> she's holding a lot of NFTs. That's why you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Right. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everyone. See y'all later.